this lesson, we're going to discuss the role that authority places in the church and in our lives. And we're going to do this while reading the story of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, who comes to Jesus with the request for the Lord to heal his servant. In this, we find a proper understanding of what authority looks like and how that relates to faith. And we are reminded by this that we should be men and women who live up to the responsibilities that are set before us. So, welcome to Kingdom of the Logos, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure. I am Pastor J. Dylan Proctor, and I thank you for joining us. And I'm not alone here in Cord Purgatory, our studio. There is one other who is with us. Pastor Anthony Alegria. And we really do thank you for joining us. We're going to have a bit of a fun conversation today. We're going to bring Spider-Man into this, Cain and Abel. We're going to be a lot of different places. But for now, we're going to open up with a reading from the gospel according to St. Matthew. And Anthony, if you would, would you begin us off with Matthew 8? When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed, and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west, and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. Alrighty, going all the way back to Cain and Abel, back in the book of Genesis, people have always wanted to shirk the duty and responsibilities that they have to others. We look in the world around us, we see that people are going out, they're doing violent crime, we see things like mass shootings, and a lot of this comes from people not growing up in a good household with a good mom and dad before them. Most of these people, they don't have a dad in their life at all, and if their dad is there, it's really bad. But overwhelmingly, there's just no father at all. We live in a day and age where a lot of times people, they shirk the responsibilities they have, and they forget what it really means to be a man of faith, to be a, a, a woman of faith as well. And when we see people shirking responsibilities and duties, sometimes this looks like passing off charity to the government, as if the government is going to be an institution that can handle that. Sometimes it looks like turning our backs to problems, and in the worst of times it actually means taking murderous actions against those to whom we are endeared, like Cain there with Abel. He went and killed his brother. And you see, Cain, he did not understand authority. He lived a life that was about his desires and his will. It was Abel, his brother, that understood that God was the one who decides good and evil, not oneself. The story of Cain and Abel ends with Cain killing his brother, and that's often what history tells us happens. Evil takes joy in killing that which is virtuous and is correctly bent towards God. In the modern day and age, people, they're fussing about things. They say, oh, toxic masculinity is out there, but someone like Cain is not an example of masculinity. Abel is. We see people stepping out of the role of what it means to be a man, to be someone who's actually a masculine figure. We see people, even ladies, stepping out of what it means to be a, a motherly, a, a womanly figure who is of God and is leading people towards righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, our world and around us that wants to move us away from the way that God designed us to be and called us to be, and that is something we should push back on. We are to rise to the occasion of being God's holy people, and that's something which is really important. So let's talk about Spider-Man. I don't know if you out there like Spider-Man. It's one of the, the characters I like. I've always really loved a lot of the Spider-Man stories. Um, the Spider-Man villains have always been really interesting to me. They're, they're really well constructed. Um, going back to the Sam Raimi series, that one with Tobey Maguire, I think they do a really good job of depicting the character. And one of the themes that you find about Spider-Man is he is this young man who is kind of at that coming of age, kind of young adult scene where you're really figuring out who you are. And he has to rise to the occasion of being the man that deals with the neighborhood problems. Again, his whole catch line is he's the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Um, I'm not here to beat up on the MCU and the Marvel stuff, but Spider-Man, when he kind of becomes Avenger, he goes a little bit more cosmic and it kind of loses the truth of who that character is. He's not someone who can call in a jet or you know talk to someone about his problems. He's actually someone who has to sit there on the rooftops and say, you know, Uncle Ben has died, these bad things have happened, and now I have to rise to the occasion. 
I can't just talk it out. I can't just expend that energy somewhere else. I actually have to rise to the occasion and be the hero to deal with the problems around us. I know, Anthony, you recently watched the, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man film back in 2002. But really, something you find in that is somebody rising to the occasion and really fighting villains who are older men who did not rise to the occasion of what it means to be righteous. They, they kind of shirked the responsibility. They took more the path of Cain than Abel. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think we do sort of have a lack of that occurring in our generation. I oh, guess. absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that that's part of the reason why there are so many movies coming out about young people striving and rising to occasions. And particularly, you know, in the older movie, it wasn't so much um, in the Tobey Maguire movie. There was this sense that it was absolutely necessary and there was never a question of whether or not I'm going to do this. It was more like, as soon as I understand the situation, I'm going to step up to the responsibility. Yeah. And you can see that with Spider-Man at the end whenever he gets kissed by Mary Jane. He sees, he sees and he understands at that point that it's necessary that he turn away from the pleasures of life, which he could have by not upholding the responsibility he has as a hero. And he could, for instance, be married to Mary Jane and things like that and have a really great relationship with her. But he's instead going to answer the responsibility he has as a hero. And he, you never see him really question that. You just see him go through the pain of accepting that responsibility. Oh yeah. Whereas if, if you look to the new Spider-Man, which I'm not trying to diss it. I actually liked it a lot. It was a great movie. But I think it's reflective of our generation that in the new Spider-Man, Tom Holland is constantly questioning whether or not he should step up to the responsibility. And he is constantly Would rather really go on a vacation. entertaining. Huh? He would rather go on a vacation. Yeah, he'd rather go on a vacation. He's yeah. entertaining and preferring uh, other options and pathways than rising to the occasion. Yeah. Though at the end he does. And, and it's really only because at the end he's basically forced to step up. Yeah, and they get that right with Tom Holland. I think they do a better job with it in Tobey Maguire, but the, the Tom Holland movie still gets that right. That's what Spider-Man's thing is. Yeah. Is he has to rise to the occasion. And as people, we're challenged with that too. And for men, the thing is, is a man's worth is found in his work. And as men and women, we are all called to be the servants of God. But men, we are to work here as sons of Adams, going out, tooling the earth, doing things which, while we are servants to God, we are keeping his order here on this earth. And women are called to keep this order too. But with Spider-Man, you see somebody who's really given the options. Do I want to just be Kane, who shirks that responsibility? If you go back to that earlier movie where with the Green Goblin, and come on, that armor is sweet. Who doesn't want to wear that Green Goblin armor? Like, that's totally awesome. No, it is the best, and it should be offered as an alternative skin for basically every video game anybody could ever play. Yeah, having that in, in one of the Souls games would be great. But anyways, no, you look at someone like the Green Goblin. He's an older man. He's been given a problem. And he chooses to become a monster. Recently, I put out the movie review on Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, and all that is about becoming the monster. Um, Cain allows himself to become the monster because he doesn't understand authority and responsibility. You cannot separate authority from responsibility. That's what we're talking about here in this, this whole program, this whole lesson. We're talking about authority. With the centurion, he understands the authority he has, and he understands that that means responsibility. And all this comes together with faith. You look at someone... Like Cain, he doesn't like the whole idea of having responsibility. He comes to God and says, you know, who am I to care about my brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Should I care about him? You know, the carnal nature tells us, go on a vacation. Forget about that. You know, take the path of least resistance. You know, the carnal nature drives us to want to do that. And our modern society really encourages people to do that. It says, be whoever you want to be. Just live into your dream. Live your truth. Speak your truth. But the gospel comes to us and says there is only one who is truly truth, and that's Christ Jesus. You're to live by his truth, not your truth. When God gives you responsibility, you know, you deal with that, and it does start locally. Um, and so now let's get back to the centurion. The centurion, he understands the language of authority. And he understands that having authority, that demands that you have responsibility to those in your care. Those who are in your custody, you must have a diligence to them. The servant here in this story is in his care and his custody. Thus, when the servant is sick, the centurion must decide how he's going to respond. Now, this is where we all are. This is where Cain was. This is where Spider-Man is in the movies. When you have someone in your care 
And if you have family with people, you know there's goodwill. We have a relationship. We're endeared to those who, who are our family. When you're there with someone, the choice you have, and even for a servant, you know, they're part of his household. He's got this person in his care, and the question is, what are you going to do? You're a person of authority. Are you going to the rise to the occasion to be a good master, or are you going to be a tyrant? If the centurion is a good master, he will stop all operations. And let's be honest, he's a centurion. Life as a centurion is not sitting on your hands all day. Life being a servant isn't sitting on your hands all day. Um, all of these people, they probably have very, very busy lives. You go back in time, not even a few hundred years, you find life is much busier than it is now. We live with a lot of luxury and modern technology. We forget how hard people have worked to get us here. Um, the centurion has a pretty busy schedule, and so would his servant. And you, when you've got one person who is down, the question you have is, what are you going to do? A tyrant would say, just replace them. Send them out. Dispatch them. But somebody who's a good master says, you know what? We've got to actually stop everything, which comes at a cost, and go and see that this person gets well or do the best we can to it. And it's fascinating that the centurion, he comes to Jesus and not Rome. Moreover, it is clearly indicated that the reason that the centurion recognizes Jesus is because of his authority. And authority is something the centurion understands. When you own up to the authority and responsibility given to you, then you do not turn to the government as a means of shirking responsibility. And the centurion did not turn to Rome. He didn't go to any Roman institutions. It's between you, God, and your family and how you're going to deal with the situations around you. Anthony? Well, also, um, it's not as though he were unfamiliar with the pagan traditions. No, he's not. He yeah. doesn't turn to idolatry. No. Which is something that we do frequently today, even though uh, you know we live in a Christian well, culture. Well, you know what, what's crazy about this is he's a Roman, so you would expect him to kind of do that naturally. Exactly, yes. It, it, it wouldn't even be idolatry by his own standards. Exactly. And yeah. it is sort of funny that even at the end, uh, Jesus says, you know, many will come from the east and west, but those who were expected to be the heirs of the kingdom... Uh, will be in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think Christians frequently, we uh, correctly um, treat that as something directed towards the Jews at the time. But I think if we read that in our own context today, I think too frequently people live in a pop Christian culture, which is uh, basically um, not fulfilling the faith that they need to be fulfilling. And I think that they forget that there are many who are the expected heirs of the kingdom who will not receive. And just like the centurion, who is not an expected heir of the kingdom but has faith, he will be the one who receives a place in the kingdom. Yeah. And what you see happening here with the centurion is he literally goes to God, like God incarnate. He doesn't turn to an idol. He doesn't turn to even a Jewish authority in the conventional sense something like a Sadducee or Pharisee, he goes to literally God, um, the master of the universe. And what we see happening here is something where someone says, I'm in authority, and this is between me, literally God, and my household. And let us be clear and emphasize this. Military units, they function like brothers. Servants, they are part of their master's household. If there's a problem with the servant and their master is not a tyrant, they are going to deal with that. I mean, it's their household. It's family. It's the family situation. If you have authority, it is your duty to maturely respond to the situations that happen in your household. And we'll get to more of that later because that doesn't mean just everyone gets their way and everyone gets to be enablers of sin or anything like that. We'll, we'll get to that later. But for the centurion, when his servant was sick, he stopped his operations and went to Christ Jesus. He went to the one that was literally God in the flesh. And dealing with crisis situations does not mean that we enable people to do whatever they want. It doesn't mean that we just sit around and say, oh, we'll give this to someone else. It means that we recognize that God has given us authority and that those who are under our authority, we must care for. God is the one who is the high king of heaven, and he sits on the throne that rules all creation. While we may be sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, and we are placed as here kings and queens on this earth having dominion over it, we are still underneath God. And we must look to God and his rules and how we are going to respond to difficult situations. And one of the things which is also fascinating to me, it's always been a little bit perplexing to me, but the older I've gotten, the more I really understand it, is that when he comes to Jesus, Jesus moves the conversation from authority to faith. There's clearly a connection between authority and faith. 
This has always been something which is a little bit strange to me. I don't know if you've ever read through this text and been like, that kind of hits me weird. I feel like there's a missing link. But the older I get and the more I understand about authority, the more the two kind of click together. And it's clear that the centurion's understanding of authority signifies somehow that he understands how God relates to humanity. Because something about humanity, even going all the way back to Cain and Abel, God has always had a covenant with his people. And his, he's had a covenant with his creation. And again, if you are in authority, you have responsibility. If you're under authority, you know, you have allegiance. There's this interesting idea about authority and jurisdiction. If you live under the jurisdiction of someone, well, they're supposed to be helping take care of you and helping be loyal to you in whatever way that may be. And in response, you be loyal to them. You are allegiance to them. You look at this in sort of a, a local level, you know, you look in your community, you have a bit of a, a bit of loyalty there with everyone. There's an idea of a mutual allegiance. Well, when we look to God, who sits in the throne of heaven, he rules all creation. He is loyal to his creatures, which means God has diligence. God has a covenantal relationship with them. And even though a lot of times humanity is really bad about that, in fact, most of the time humanity is bad about living up our side, God still keeps up his responsibility to us. And it's, it's, this is where the connection between faith and authority happens. The centurion understands that if somebody in my care is sick, I must deal with that. I don't get to throw it off to Rome. I don't get to go somewhere else and say, oh, let's have some policy to deal with this. He says, this is something I need to deal with. And he goes to God. It's between him, God, and the person with the problem. And Jesus looks at that and says, this, you understand something about how God works with creation because Christ Jesus, the Messiah, he is here under the will of the Father. And he's here because God has due diligence with his creation. It is clear that the centurion's understanding of authority signifies how God relates to humanity. The centurion does not live his life for himself, nor to be a tyrant. The servant lives his life as duty to others, and he recognizes that Jesus is here because God is faithful and his duties are to his creation. Now, God wouldn't have to do that, but God is a loving God who's not a tyrant. The centurion, the centurion truly understands that the covenant between God and humanity is something which is very strong. And he understands this better than many of the Israelites. Jesus recognizes that the centurion has faith because the centurion has a deep understanding of duty to those beneath him. He understands that when has a duty to those he commands, he has a duty to make sacrifices on behalf of those in his care. And see, this is really what the world needs. The world needs men and women of faith who understand authority. Even when the world is in spite of God and is acting like a tyrannical child who thinks it has more power than it does, God has still commanded us to be a holy people. And the world is still hungry for righteousness, even if it doesn't realize it. Anthony? I think uh, what you said about faithfully following authority is very, very interesting, especially in light of how the world treats that authority. And so um, you compared how the world acts to uh, a bad child. I forget the exact language <laughs> that you used, but a child that's not behaving well. And it made me think just now, whenever a child doesn't behave well and you are correcting them, do you address the child in the terms that the child has come to you with. You know, whenever a child thinks that it's not the appropriate time for bedtime or that it is perfectly safe to run across the road for these reasons, do you address the child in terms of their own logic and uh, their own reasoning? Or do you simply say that, you know, I am your parent yeah. or I am the person in place of you right now and I am telling you that... I'm telling you with the authority that's been entrusted to me as either your parent or your guardian that um, it is your bedtime. You need to brush your teeth too or uh, you know, you need to stop playing in the street or whatever else. I think in the same way, that is how we should address a lot of the problems of the world until they come seeking understanding rather than coming in the name of challenge because I do believe that our faith is a rational one, certainly. And I believe God gave us reason for a reason, <laughs> to use it. And I believe that it's one of our strengths that we're called to use in the name of God. But um, I also have come to realize that whenever people come in the name of challenge, they haven't come for a rationale. 
they've come for religious contest in a way. Yeah. And your rationale is not going to be what turns their hearts. It is going to be the testimony of your life and the testimony they see of the spirit at work if there is going to be change. Um, and even that is not going to convert everybody. And so uh, I think in many ways we should not justify the authority God has with reason as frequently as we do for the sake of those who have come in the name of challenge. And instead, we should simply assert uh, that that authority is real. Well, I mean, Jesus, he doesn't reason with the devil in the wilderness because that's not why the devil's there. Yep. And and in this story, you want to know who's not part of this conversation between Jesus and the centurion? The one being healed. Yeah, the one being healed. <laughs> it, it's one of those little details that you might miss when you read through this, but it's totally there. The servant is not part of this conversation. We have no idea what the servant wants. He may have asked his master and say, oh, please go find the Lord of <laughs> creation who is incarnate. I don't know. Um, but we know that the centurion, he took it on himself and said, I need to go to the right authority for this. I have authority and I'm also under authority. And there's one who rules all. At some level, whether it be conscious or totally unconscious, something triggers the centurion's mind that Jesus is the right one to go to. Not anyone in Rome, not some idol, not anything else, not even in his own power. You know, there are times where it's beyond our power. It's not even his own power. He knows who the right authority is on this issue. And, and again, the servant who is sick, not consulted about this all, to our knowledge. It's not in the story um, at all. Yeah, it's just kind of how it is. So, Moving back to our original question, who has authority over you? In the church, we know that God has designed humanity with the purpose of having dominion over the earth. God desires that men and women would be kings and queens of the earth who keep God's order as his designated servants. And while we are here on this earth, we recognize that we are sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. That means that the carnal nature of sin, it runs in our veins. But it also means... And this is where things really get a little bit more important. It also means that the Lord God of heaven and earth sent his begotten son to purchase new life for us at the cost of his begotten son's life. It also means that we are commanded to be a holy people. Just because the carnal nature is something we have inherited doesn't mean that we should ever stop there. We should rise to the occasion. Just the centurion, he rose to the occasion, he stopped his operations, and he sought out God. This was the adventure of holiness. You know, we've talked a lot about the adventure of holiness. It takes on a lot of different forms, but it is always moving towards God. He doesn't go to Rome. He doesn't go to any governmental or pagan or idolatrous spirit of the age. He doesn't go to anything like that. He goes directly to God with the problem. And whenever we have things in life, again, sometimes the servants that are sick, you know, they want things. Maybe it's someone struggling with a problem in life. Maybe they have an addiction. They say, well, why don't you just give me the next hit? You know, maybe it's somebody who just wants to do something else that's sinful or, or not right in life. You know, they say, well, why don't you just accept me as I am? Just let it happen. Just let me live my truth. But that's not what the gospel message tells us to do. To the question, who has authority over you? The truth is that every person out there is going to have a God in their life. The secular world, I know my generation, and maybe yours too out there listening to this, was brought up saying, you know, if you just let people come into adulthood, they will choose when they get there. You know, let them be an open slate till they're ready for that. It's a huge error in upbringing of people. It's a huge error of logic because it's just logically not true. People are going to have a, they're going to have a God. Whatever is at the top of a person's moral compass is the God of their life. And people, they need something to tell them good and evil. If you've got something to tell you good and evil, that's what, it, that's what your God is. If people are constantly relating everything to politics, then politics has become the God of their life. If people are constantly relating everything to their identity, then that has become their idol. Their own person has become their idol. The notion that people can live without a God is just utterly false. People are going to live by some moral code, and whatever is giving them their moral code is their God. It is from God that we find our morality, and it is from that that people, they live their lives and they follow things. In the church, we must not forget that evil and temptation, they come to convict people. People with idols and false gods, they convict them. Therefore, we must consecrate ourselves to God and only to the Holy Spirit of God. Because if not, 
we'll find ourselves in temptation. There are all sorts of gods out there that are going to convict people, and they're going to think it's sincere. They're going to think what they're doing is good. But if it doesn't line up with the gospel, then there's a problem. You see, while we do have the Holy Spirit, and oftentimes the elements of the Holy Spirit, they're unexplainable. They're, you know, inexplicable. But they're not subjective in the way that the world would want them to be. doesn't mean that everything is of the Holy Spirit. There are evil forces that come to tempt us. Cain, he was pretty well convicted by his own will, his own idol, himself, said, you know, I really want to live without this responsibility of my brother. I don't want to rise to the occasion of being the man that God designed me to be. I don't want to have responsibility to my family. I don't want to do that. I just want to shirk it and throw it away. And he became murderous. He turned against his own brother. We look to the gospel, and this is not what we're commanded to do. We're to be people under the authority of God. But nowhere does the gospel tell us to arbitrarily submit to any authority that is above us. Instead, it tells us to be peacemakers as we submit to the laws of God. However, if the worldly forces get in conflict with the laws of God, we follow God and not the world. Whenever the people in our lives ask us to do things that are against the gospel, we must stand firm in our allegiance to God. This is often difficult because evil likes to mask itself as things that are good. You know, temptation... Anthony, is temptation good or bad at being temptation? Let me just ask that. <clears throat> That's a weird question. <laughs> well, no, it's sign of circular it's, logic. But people often act like, you know, I can outsmart evil, but, you know. No, yes, and this is, uh, to kind of build off of what you're saying, this is the grand mistake of Cain, and this is what I would call the mark of Cainhood, is... Whenever you believe that you are the exception. Yeah. When you believe that you're the going to be the one mm-hmm. who can face the devil and reason with him and resist temptation, then, uh, you know, yours is the fate of Cain. Yeah. Which is a cursed life. Oh, yeah. Um, and in bitterness, which comes with that cursed life. Yeah. But, you know, if you uh, instead... Follow the way of Abel, make the best and most appropriate sacrifices, and realize that in the grand scheme of things that you are dust in the wind, that it that it is very, very lucky to have the blessing and focus of God, then maybe you will respond in the way Christ did with the word of God, rather than with the word of God used in a particular way, used to shield the heart from temptation maybe then you can overcome it yeah you know temptation it's in the name is really good at being temptation and what tempts people is really different from person to person but the truth of it is is temptation is pretty darn good at tricking you to thinking that it's good you know eve there in the garden you know cain's mother she was sitting there with that fruit and she's like you know this is good for food that is what it says and it's it is uh <laughs> crazy really and you know what's crazy she was probably right that it was good for food, but that wasn't the whole story. Yep. And <laughs> she responded with the word of God. Yeah. I'm not permitted to eat this. Yeah. There's one tree in the garden that I'm not allowed to have. Yep. Yeah. Uh, maybe we would not live in the tragedy of the world that we do today. Yeah. And, and you know, that's the thing, though. Um, temptation is good at tricking you that things are evil or good. That's just how it is. And people are going to have something in their life telling them what is good. And if it's not God, there's a problem. And when we have authority, we must rise to the occasion of the design that God made us for. We must rise to the authority given to us. The church is not accidental in God's will. It's an instrument commanded to be holy. We are certainly not the author of God's will, but God has all the same called us to submit to him so that we could be instrumental in his will on earth. He has given us the great gift of responsibility on this earth. And we must be good stewards of the gospel. We must have great diligence in our our care. Cain did not rise to the occasion of having the responsibility over his brother. Rather, he chose to kill him. A lot of times people do that. They see something they don't like, they'd rather just send it away. This is not what God called us to do. However, we look in comparison, the centurion, he did rise to the occasion. He didn't give in to the temptation to just look at the self, to live out, you know, his truth, his interest, his desire. He can't afford to do that. He's a centurion. His worth is found in how good he is at being a centurion. And that's what his position is in life. And even by the standards of the world, he understands that. And it's through that language of authority that he looks to God. And again, he's 
obviously he's a, a centurion. The chance of him knowing much of Jewish culture is not very high. But he looks to, to Jesus and says, you know what? That man, he has authority. It's divine authority. And I recognize that. I speak the language of authority. I see that there is something going on here. He's here because he has a duty to creation, and I have a duty to those in my care. Anthony? Well, uh, he also demonstrates his understanding of um, Jewish tradition in that he understands his own presence to be unclean. Oh, yeah. A lot of times we see uh, the centurion say that Jesus should not come into his house and we think that it is simply because he's just that humble. And maybe he was just that humble. But there's also the looming uh, cultural aspect of it, which is that Jews considered the houses of the Gentiles unclean, which yeah. most of the time, to the Jewish standards, they probably were. There was probably unclean food inside the house. There were probably things that they considered to be unclean present within the house. And so it's not just like a discrimination sort of thing. It's more like a... If you actually analyze it according to uh, the rules of their practice, it would be basically almost a 100% probability that you would come into contact with something unclean in the in the house of a Gentile. And so, you know, it was made part of the culture that um, the houses of the Gentiles were unclean. And he could be demonstrating very well that the centurion, it, that is, he could be demonstrating that he recognizes the authority of the Jewish tradition, and that um, his household is not fit for Christ. And But in faith, he uh, approaches Christ with the belief that God loves all of creation, including the servant of the Gentiles. Well, it certainly doesn't stop him. Yes. He, he is not disabled by his uncleanliness. He He's realizes not. he has a duty. He has a duty to the servant. He's got to make good on that. That is actually really beautiful. That's a point that I made whenever I preached um, concerning the cleansing of the leper right before this, is that according to the law, uh, the leper very well should have stayed away from Christ. But that did not stop him because he had faith that rather than defiling Christ, that Christ would be able to heal him. Yeah, and, and again... As we were talking about earlier, we must rise to the occasion. You look at someone like Spider-Man, it's a great archetype of a man rising to the occasion to stop others who didn't rise to the occasion. And the centurion here, he is doing just that. And we in the church, we must rise to the occasion of the authority given to us. We are created in the image of God, and all of us are either a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve. And while that does mean that the carnal nature of sin runs through our veins, it also means that our salvation was purchased at the price of God's own son, because God is faithful to us. And as we close this out today, think about the authority you have in life. Think about who you give authority to. You know, Are you giving it to God as you should? And remember that we are commanded to rise to the occasion of holiness. We are, rise, we are commanded to rise to the occasion of holiness and bless the world around us. And with that, God love you and have a blessed day. so much better hey stop it I'm trying to do this music right now and it's gonna come out bad